Hello everybody and welcome to today's virtual online drama workshop. My name's Steph Meskel-Brocken. I am the Artistic Director of Minerva Arts. Minerva Arts is an arts education and development charity based here in Cheshire. We run a range of different activities all across the area, including youth theatre groups for children and young people, um, work experience and volunteering opportunities, commissioned work where we go and deliver for other people, and we also create and develop, fundraise for and manage our own projects. Um, sometimes they involve heritage, sometimes they involve social action, but they're always about getting children, young people and communities involved in arts and culture and using arts and culture as a way of exploring themes, issues and stories that are important to the people that we're working with. So what are we doing today? Well, this workshop is based on a workshop that I actually delivered um, a couple of years back at the last Heritage and Antiques Festival, where I worked with a group of young people to use drama to explore some heritage stories from the local area. So what I'm going to do today is take you through some activities that you can do in your very own home um, in order to have a go at this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at um, a style of drama called melodrama. Now melodrama was a style of drama that became very popular during the 19th century and it was all about big characters, lots of action, lots of drama happening in the story and um, usually some form of conflict between good and evil. You would get a lot of uh, melodramatic stories uh, that involved bad things happening to a damsel in distress and her having to be rescued from the clutches of a villain. Melodramas would also often have quite class-based stories as well. So you would tend to find that the villain in your melodrama would be a character who was maybe the local squire or the landowner in some way. So I have a couple of exercises that I would like you to have a go at. In melodrama, we have something called stock characters. And these stock characters are characters that are archetypes, they're shells, they're frames of a character that remain the same regardless of what the story is. So that's not to say that the, the key characteristics are always going to be the same, they won't have the same name, they won't have the same background, they won't be going through the same emotions, but they have a framework within which we put all of the other important stuff about the story into. And usually these stock characters will be the hero, the villain, the damsel in distress, and the protective parent. So what I'd like you to do first is I would like you to choose one of those four stock characters, and I would like you to stand up in front of your screen, okay? It's not really an awful lot of space for me to do that, but We'll give it a go and, uh, and you'll get the idea. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to transform into this character in a physical way. We're going to look at both voice and physical with these characters. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start standing in what we call in drama neutral position. A neutral position has our feet flat on the floor. It has our feet pointing forwards, which for some people can feel a little bit unnatural, so don't force it, but try and make it happen. Your knees should be soft, so they're not locked in position, but they're not bent, they're just nice and soft. Our weight should be evenly distributed in our hips, so we're not leaning to one side or the other. Our arms will be by our sides. Our shoulders will be relaxed, and to check that your shoulders are in the right position, just give them a little roll backwards and down. And finally, our head should be nicely balanced on top of our shoulders and our point of focus 
should be bang ahead of where we're facing. So this is neutral position and um, the name would suggest what it does. It basically gives you a blank slate. It means that you've got no character at that point in time. So once you've got your neutral starting point, you can then start adding new things on top of there, new bits of character. So choose your character. So you're either the hero, the villain, the damsel in distress, or the protective parent. And we're going to work feet up. So firstly, how do you think that character might stand? Are you going to change your stance from being shoulder width apart to standing with your feet absolutely glued together? Or does this character take up more space? Have they got a wider positioning? Think about where that weight sits. Are they completely equal in how they hold their weight or do they stand more over to one side than the other? Are they a fidgeter? Sometimes um, somebody who's quite fidgety moves around quite a lot. That can tell us a lot about a character. It might mean that they're nervous and they're not quite sure of themselves or it might just mean that they're a massive bundle of energy and they want to be moving around all the time. Think about what they're doing with their posture. Do they stand quite straight and tall? Are their shoulders back? Have they got an open chest? Or do they hunch over a little bit more? See how that changes automatically what you think about a character as you see it. They might be a little bit uh, closed off or not really wanting to talk to people or they might be scared and a bit nervous. Think about what they're doing with their hands. I've already started using my hands and arms with these changes of posture. So do they, are they a hands in pockets kind of person? Do they cross their arms over the front of their body, which kind of creates like a shield almost to say, don't talk to me, I don't want to get involved. Are they, again, a bit of a fidgeter maybe? Do they play with their hair a lot? Or are they actually very disciplined about the way they hold their hands and arms? Are they in front, to the side, or maybe behind? Thinking about how they hold their neck and their head, that's also quite key. Do they hold tension in that area? And where are they looking? If they're quite a confident, self-assured kind of person, they might be always looking up and around them because they're happy to engage with somebody. They're alert, always wanting to know what's happening. The opposite of that would be somebody who's always looking down at the floor, saying, I, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to engage with anything. So think about that full process all the way up from the feet. And if you're doing that piece by piece, every little bit of your body then changes to embody that character. And by the time you've moved all the way up, you've got a full, new physical representation of that character. So have a go at it maybe with all of them. Once you've had a go at one, have a go at another one and see what the differences are between those characters. What you might want to have a go at doing is exaggerating some of this. So in melodrama um, we have quite big characters and often in any type of drama that is using stock characters we are um, presenting something that is over the top. It's bigger than we would do it in normal life because our audience need to be able to really understand and get immediately what kind of character we're playing. So revisit one of the physical versions that you've done of one of these characters and have a go at maybe taking it on a scale of one to ten. So for example, um, if I've worked up from feet to head on the hero character, for example, I might have decided, well, the hero's got quite a wide stance. Uh, he's holding himself very straight. His weight is um, evenly distributed on his hips. His hands are maybe behind his back because he's quite military in the way that he stands. His shoulders are quite relaxed, though, because he's self-assured. He knows himself. He's confident. And he's always looking out for what is around him. So his head is always up. 
if I'm doing this at the moment, maybe if number one was neutral position, so I had no character at all, this might be a number five because I've added some character, but I haven't over exaggerated it in any way. If I were to try and take that maybe to a seven on our scale, it might be that I widen my stance a little bit more and I uh, really exaggerate what I'm doing with my shoulders and my arms and my head might suddenly start to move a little bit more. I might be over exaggerating the fact that he's very aware and he wants to know what is happening everywhere all the time. And then if I were to take that another couple of steps up that scale, then it would become really huge. And um, my position of my arms might actually be a little bit wider so that you can see more movement in them. I might start to move around the space a little bit. I might really have to over exaggerate coming back into a straight up position to show my power, my powerful nature. That's just an example. So I'm going to sit down again now. There we go. That was graceful, wasn't it? So that's a really quick and simple way of starting to think about how we create a physicality of a character. But with melodrama, we're not just acting physically. We're also acting vocally as well. So we need to think not only about giving our characters a unique way of standing and holding themselves and moving, but also a unique way of speaking, which again helps to tell the audience something about who that character is. So I want you to have a think about giving each of these characters a voice. What do they sound like? What's the tone of their voice? Uh, what's their volume? What's the pitch? And what's the speed? So they're the key things that we're looking at. We're looking at tone, pitch, volume, and speed. If you've got a particular talent in this area, you could always give them an accent as well. But some people have got a skill in that area, some people haven't, so don't worry about that. Tone, pitch, volume, speed. How would they differ between each of these key stock characters? And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pick one of your characters, I'd like you to make your decisions about that character on their tone, their pitch, their volume and their speed, and then I'm going to give you some dramatic lines that I want you to try and deliver as that character, okay? So here's your first one. Try and um, maybe say it back to me once I've said it, okay? First one is, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. Second one, this is our last chance for survival. And again, this is our last chance for survival. Next one, I've never felt this way before. I've never felt this way before. Get away from me. Get away from me. Quick, he's got a gun. Quick, he's got a gun. And final one, you'll regret ever coming to this town. You'll regret ever coming to this town. So what you might want to do with those lines, as well as experimenting with those four different characteristics of your voice, have a bit of a play at changing where the emphasis is for each of those lines. So you can take the emphasis onto different words and help to make the line sound slightly different, give it slightly different meaning each time you say it. Um, you can also then add emotion to those lines as well. So one, for example, is um, that first one, I can't believe you did that. That could be delivered either as a, a really sad sentence. It could be delivered as a really angry sentence. It could be delivered as a disappointed sentence. 
So each one of those dramatic sentences has, a, uh, has lots of different potentials in there for how you can deliver it. So try and go through those, maybe experimenting with each of those different characters, remembering to go back to tone, pitch, volume and speed, playing with the emphasis and playing with the emotions. Then you are well on your way to starting to have some quite clear stock characters that you can use for a piece of melodrama. So the next thing, once you're at this stage, you can then start to create some scenes with that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some examples of scenarios that you might be able to take those characters and put them into. So you're going to need to be working with somebody for this, somebody else in your household. So if you've been doing this on your own, it's time to go and find somebody who might be hiding in the next room to come and take part in this next exercise with you. So what I've got is a different scenario for each of those characters to have a lead in. But that, what that means is that whoever it is that that character then plays off against, they can pick any of the other stock characters to be. Um, and that will mean that the scene changes and, and is unique depending on who you've chosen. So here are your four scene examples. First one is uh, the villain is at the centre of this one. And the villain has bought something from a shop and they need to take it back. Very simple. They've bought something at a shop, they're not happy with it, they need to return it. Plenty of drama to be found from that. Number two is the damsel in distress at the centre of this story. And this is taking her a little bit of, as a fish out of water. The damsel in distress is actually the coach of a football team and she uh, is giving them their half-time half team talk and they are losing really badly. Okay, so that's a tough one. That one, that's a situation that you wouldn't necessarily assume that the damsel would find herself in. So she's coaching the football team, she's given a half-time team talk and they've been losing at half-time. Number three, puts our hero at the centre. And this scene, the hero is in a car that has broken down at the side of the M6. What's going to happen? How is the hero going to deal with this situation? Maybe they thrive in that situation, or maybe things go a little bit wrong for them. And finally, scene four, the protective parent is attempting to coax a cat down from a tree. How is the parent looking on the cat? Is the parent treating the cat like it's a child? Or does the parent happen to have the damsel in distress with them who is their child and they won't let them get involved in it? Loads of room for different drama to happen in there. So each of those scenarios has a character at the centre, but you can choose which of the other stock characters they then play off against in that scene. So what we did in our workshop um, a couple of years ago is we then took this um, common form, this structure of drama, and we applied it to a heritage story. And the one that we used for melodrama was, one that I'm sure you all know very well, was the Bear Town story. Very local to Congleton, um, something that a lot of people know and have heard of before. So how would we use melodrama to tell this story? Well, it's got to be exaggerated. We probably need to add bits of the story to create more drama. And we need to think about how those stock characters can be applied to the characters who are really in the story. So we probably need to add some additional characters in that might not be real people. So that's a little bit of a challenge for you. I'm going to give you an example of how our children um, did that story. But what I'd like you to do at home is to take the Bear Town story as your stimulus material and create your own piece of melodrama. You want to have each of those four stock characters represented in that story. So think about whether you can make them apply to a real person or whether you need to create a whole new character to do it. And Think about how you can add some additional drama, conflict, peril into the story. 
So we did this um, in four scenes. So here's just one example. By all means, you can take this and have a go at acting it out, but make your own version as well. So scene one. Scene one showed the bear and it, show, it introduced us to a villain character. And the villain was actually responsible for the death of the bear. The villain had given the bear a poison apple to eat. Scene two showed the staff planning the wakes event and it was going to be a very special wakes event this year because the queen was coming for some reason um so this scene showed the group planning the event and then getting the news about the bear having died and them knowing that there was no money within that scene everybody in, around the table was giving strange ideas, weird ideas about what they could do to get more money or what they could do to replace the bear and all of this. And at the end of that scene, a servant gave their idea. Now this servant was introduced as the hero. That's quite key in melodrama because as I said at the beginning, there's often a class aspect to melodrama. So having somebody who's from a lowly class position rise up and be the hero of the story is very classic melodrama. So scene three was the visiting the alderman and they handed over the money from the, the, the sale of the bible and somebody had to go off and buy the bear but at the end of that scene we saw the villain hanging back hanging behind and dressing up as the old bear using the, the bear skin to make himself look like a bear. The final scene, scene four, um, was they bought the new bear. The festivities went broadly pretty well until the villain appeared in his costume as the bear to start a fight with the new bear, the real bear, to try and make the bear go crazy and kill everybody. Um, but it all went wrong for the villain um, and he was eventually unmasked and they all lived happily ever after. So we had our villain character, we had our hero character. Um, I think the alderman was a good character to use as, as the protective parent type character, but maybe somebody that showed a little bit of resistance to progressing the story. That's really helpful in creating drama because drama often comes from conflict. And the conflict can occur when somebody doesn't is putting blocks in the way, doesn't want the hero and the rest of the characters to succeed with their aim. And the damsel in distress character came out through some of the other staff that were involved um, in, the, in the, the planning of the wakes event. So that's just one example. You can do what you like with how you create your own story. And it would be lovely if you were able to share that in some way with us, um, maybe using some of the, the social media channels that I'll tell you about at the end. So you can, by all means, pause us there uh, because I'm now going to move on to a second form of theatre and some more exercises that you can do. So why not take a moment to stop and then you can restart. So this is part two and for this section we're going to talk a little bit about physical theatre. So um, I'm going to tell you about two physical theatre exercises that you can do that um, will kind of introduce the different ways that we use physical theatre. The first one is called 10 second object. What I'd like you to do for this, you can do it on your own, but it's really great to do with somebody else as well. So you're going to start off in your pair or your small group or on your own in neutral. I'm going to give you the name of an ordinary everyday household object and then I'm going to count down from 10 down to 1 and you've got that time to turn yourself into that object. If you're working with another person then you've got two bodies to work with so think about how you connect with each other. Think about using different levels so you may be standing, somebody might be crouching or on their knees in a mid level, somebody might use the floor as well. Okay so our first one is poster. 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 
one. Time's up. Freeze where you are. Take a look. How do you think you've got on? How much like a toaster does your image look? Number two. I would like to see, please, a washing machine. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. And freeze. How do you think you've got on there? Next one. I would like to see a bookcase, please. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and freeze. Interesting. Okay. And for your final one, I would like to see, please, a chest of drawers in ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and freeze. Okay. So you might want to add some additional objects into that. Use it a bit as a bit of a challenge between you and the other people that you're playing with. How that activity works is it shows us one aspect of physical theatre which is called body as prop and when we do body as prop what we're doing is we're basically using ourselves our physical bodies instead of props that we might actually bring onto the stage with us or piece, big pieces of set so that's a really um important um theatre skill for when we're creating theatre that doesn't use a lot of stuff, where if we've got a very minimal set, if that's what we're going for, then it might be that we use, we create everything that appears on stage purely using our bodies. So here's our exercise number two, and this is called Around By Through. And I'll just stand up for this one for a bit, just give you a bit of an example. So again, um, you can do this on your own. If you're on your own, what I would suggest is getting a piece of furniture, like my chair, to be your partner. But if you've got somebody else that you're doing the activity with, then you can play it either as a two or in a three. That's fine. So the basic um, stimulus for this activity is you are going to experiment with different ways of moving with either your object or your partner. The first way you're going to try and move is around it. That is your stimulus. Think about what you consider when you think about the word around. So in its most simple form, it might mean just very simply walking around the object or the person. I don't have an awful lot of space to do fancy stuff here. But once you've done one example, think about, well, how could I change that? Could I change my level so that I'm moving around on a mid-level? Could I come right down to the floor and do it so you can't even see me on the screen when I'm doing that? Might I go backwards to go around? Is there... Is there something um, that I could do that makes it look like I'm going somewhere? Maybe I'm exploring. So I change my position a few times as I go around the object. Okay? There is no right or wrong answer with this. So that's your first one, around. Second one is by. Interesting. Okay, how do we go buy something? So when we go buy something, it might just mean that we are passing it. Maybe we're passing the front of it. Maybe we're passing the side of it. Maybe we're just passing the back of the object or the person. How can we change that? Go through that same process. Is it about levels? Is it about direction? Is it about having a spin or a turn in there? Is it about the rhythm that we move in? Can we stop and start a few times as we do it? Lots of different things that you can play with there. And your third one is through. 
Now that's a little bit tougher if we've got an object that we're using rather than a person. <laughs> so if I'm looking at this chair, I'm thinking, there's not really many ways that I can go through this chair. I'm not magic. But what I might do is think about passing over the chair in some way. I'm not going to do that because this chair is actually quite broken and um, me falling over or and impaling myself on a chair would not be a good thing to have in this workshop. But think about how you go over. If you've got a partner, um, think about using their body. So are you going to go through their legs? Can you get, move under their arms? Can you move around their body in a kind of really fluid, dancey type way? With your objects, um, can you look at going under them as well as over them? Can you use uh, a part, maybe the back of the chair as a way of passing through that object? Again, like I said, there is no right or wrong answer with any of this. Because this activity shows us a little bit about the more abstract way that we can sometimes use physical theatre. So whereas with body as prop, we're turning our bodies into something very specific, we've said, okay, we need a door in this scene. Uh, we haven't got a bit of set, so we're going to use our bodies as the door. The door opens, it has a job to do. But when we use abstract physical theatre, we're often using it to actually tell more of a story or to talk about the emotions that are being expressed through that narrative. So we can express um, horror or anguish or upset or happiness purely through undertaking some actions that are done completely physically. We can tell an entire story using just our bodies and no speaking if we wanted to. So um, a really good exercise to use to experiment with using physical theatre is to just take a well-known story, something that you know really well, you know it inside out. Um, if I'm working with children, usually this is a fairy tale, something that's got a really clear beginning, middle and end. And we're going to turn that into a piece of physical theatre. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to think about your story and I want you to make a note of the five most important bits in that story. So if you were telling it to somebody, what would be the five bits that you would say? So they effectively are now going to turn into your five scenes or five movements in the piece. With each of those different elements, your five scenes, I want you to create a still image. Just a freeze frame for now. It doesn't need to move and there's no talking in it. So we're just creating a photograph, almost a snapshot of what, that, what happens within that scene. Once you've got your five still images, you're then going to add a movement into each of those scenes. So for example, if we're doing Snow White and one of your still images is of Snow White holding the apple, your single movement that you might add into that might be the bite. It's really important, isn't it? When you've decided what those movements are going to be, take them through that same process that we did when we were making our stock characters before exaggerate it make it bigger because when we're if we're being abstract if we're being physical again we need to think about how we communicate to the audience and if we're being small it's really hard for an audience to follow what it is that we're doing be big with everything finally i want you to link each of those five scenes so um rather than uh, still image number one being somebody knocking at a door and then still image number two being an apple. How is that going to move? How are we going to move from this to this? I mean, I've given you a rubbish example there because it's actually quite easy to do that. But what I'm getting at 
is that what we don't want to have is still image number one, dropping to neutral, thinking what we're supposed to do next, and then image number two. We want them to be smooth and we want them to be fluid. And if you're feeling really confident with movement, add something fancy, add something a bit dancey and lovely into that transition between those two scenes. Make it look as beautiful and as interesting as you possibly can do. So what we um, did, the story that we used with physical theatre was a horror story. We used the story of the Congleton cannibal. Because <laughs> um, you know kids love gory stuff. So um, I don't know whether everyone will have heard of that story. Um, so I'll just give you a really quick pricey of that story. So um, it goes all the way back to 1776 and it was a, a man named Samuel Thorley. So when the uh, there was a dismembered body found of a lady named Anne Smith. She was a ballad singer and her body was found at Houghty Brook. Um, there were body parts recovered and reassembled in a local barn um, and it became clear that that body wasn't complete. Um, so Thorley was also a butcher and um, on the night of the murder, he was seen wearing his bloody apron that he would have been wearing for his work anyway, but was also seen wet up to the waist, um, which was unusual at that time um, because it was very cold. It was the middle of November. He visited a lady called Mrs. Oakes and gave her a piece of meat, which he said was pork to cook. Thorley cooked it himself the following day. And although he didn't, uh, he didn't eat it um, as it, he thought it was off and it made him very, very ill. Mrs. Oakes decided to keep the meat for boiling up for grease, but, spoiler, it wasn't pork. It was human flesh. And um, once the police and the local surgeon had discovered that it was human flesh, Samuel Thorley was arrested. His trial took place on the 3rd of April the following year, having waited for the spring assizes, and he confessed to being told that human flesh resembled pork and he decided to try it to see. And he was hanged on the 10th of April, 1777. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's quite a gory story. It's, it's gross. But um, what the children then did was pick, go through that exact same process. So they picked out what they thought were the most important parts of the story. They created um, still images for that. We link them together and what we then did was we added some narration on top of that just to make it even clearer for the audience what the story was that we that we were telling. So um, by all means I think it'd be great if you were to take that story of the Congleton Cannibal. It's really easy to find online if you want to google it and the version that I've just used then comes from the very wonderfully named website classicbritishmurder.com so, um, so do check that out and use that story as a stimulus for a piece of physical theatre. But of course, now that you've got that formula, starting with the still images, um, adding a movement to the still images, linking them up together, maybe adding some uh, narration onto top of it. You can also maybe add sound effects as well if you wanted to. You can then use that with any story that you want. So um, there we go. That brings me to the end of the activities and the exercises that I was going to take you through today. I think we've done pretty well there, about just over half an hour's worth of activities. Um, and of course, stop and start this workshop um, as you go to take part in all of the different activities. I would absolutely love it if you could let us know if you've done the workshop what you enjoyed the most, um, how your melodrama stories and your physical theatre pieces ended up looking. You can get in touch with Minerva Arts um, using our social media channels. We're on Facebook, you can just search Minerva Arts. We're on Twitter at We Are Minerva. And we're also on Instagram as well at Minerva underscore arts. And if you want to find out any more about what we're doing, um, what we get up to in Cheshire, our youth theatre groups and all of our projects, then you can just visit us online at www.minervaarts.com. We're very easy to find.
So it was lovely to do this workshop for you today. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, and I hope that at some point in the future, I'll get to see all of you um, face to face in the real world. But for now, thank you so much for getting involved. Enjoy the rest of the festival and bye-bye for now.